All right, church family, you may be seated. I have some exciting news for you today. Today, as you'll see over here, we have Kobe Sanchez, and he comes to us today. As you know, he wants to be baptized. And they, the New Testament teaches us that scriptural baptism is a picture of what God has already done in the heart and in the life of a believer. And I know he has some special people here with him today. And so if you're part of Kobe's family, would you right where you are, would you stand so that our church family could honor you today? Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. And you all may be seated. Thank you for being here today. As I mentioned, baptism is a picture of what God's already done in the heart and life of a believer. And we do what's called believer's baptism because you have to believe that Jesus is Lord of your life before you can follow him in obedience in baptism. And when Kobe's baptized here in just a moment, he's going to be identifying with Jesus and having Jesus identify with him. What's neat about it is for the past few thousand years, all the people who have followed Jesus and walked with him in obedience have been baptized in a similar fashion. When I explained baptism to him, I showed him a picture of uh, me when I had been fishing, and I pointed at the picture. I said, what are those? He said, fish. I said, you're right, but those are not actually fish. And he looked at me. He said, what are they? They're a picture of fish. It's not the real thing. And so today, what we're doing is a picture of the real thing. It shows what God has done in Kobe's life and what the Lord promises to do to all those who follow him in faith and in repentance. And so today, we're going to be able to baptize him. And when he's baptized, he's going to go below the water. This symbolizes being buried. Romans 6, 4 tells us we were buried with him, talking about Jesus, by baptism. We were buried with him by baptism. And what happens after that? We don't stay buried. We're raised to walk, it goes on to tell us, in the newness of life. And so today, Kobe, I have a question for you. And y'all, he's ready to baptize himself. He's so excited. <laughs> he's been waiting, haven't you? And uh, you can just tell he's genuine. He really loves Jesus. If you have ever met Kobe, you know his heart is huge. And uh, we know that God gave him that big heart so he could use it. And so I've got a question for you. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and then raised from the dead? Yes. All right. And you confess him as Lord of your life? Yes. All right. Well, that being said, go ahead and get your hands ready. There you go. All right. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Master, as a public profession of the faith that you've placed in him, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. so I need more than I normally do. Uh, well, if you are a visitor, welcome. Uh, we are glad you are here and get used to this because I was talking to Brother Adam this morning and this isn't the only baptism we have going this summer. We have one next week and maybe one even tonight and one uh, the week after that. So we are excited and we are, we are ready to be doing that. Um, church family, thank you. I, I am here this morning, I, I promise you, I am here. Uh, and we are very thankful for your prayers. If you are a guest, I'll let you know, we, uh, by we I mean myself, my wife, and eight students went to West Monroe, Louisiana and worked a day camp uh, at Seeker Springs. It's all of us wearing these burnt orange shirts. Um, uh, we, we worked a day camp all week and we were thankful for your prayers, we needed them. It was a long week. Uh, I do not have my normal voice. Most of them you will see look like zombies. Uh, we're all kind of tired. Um, <clears throat> but the Lord provided in many ways. Uh, I'll put it like this. I knew it was going to be a good trip when Monday morning I hit one of our kids in the face with a volleyball. Um, and, and the Lord assured it would be a good trip when we ran out of gas uh, coming back. So we made it though. We made it. Plenty well. Ed, you're right. When that gas gauge hits a quarter of a tank, you don't know when it's going to go out. I learned that. Learned that hardcore. Um, but it was good. It was a wonderful week. And we do thank you for your prayers because the, the kingdom was expanded through our students. It was, um, it was a week 
that I'm incredibly proud of our family, the students. Uh, I, I got to watch, um, even, even all the way down to our younger sixth grade students, step up and be leaders, step up and share the gospel. Um, and it was just, I'm incredibly proud, I'm blessed. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful for who they are, um, you know, uh, as we were dealing with not having gas yesterday, um, the only thing they brought was joy to the entire situation. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll show videos and things like that later, but um, I'm thankful to you as a church family for praying for us. <laughs> Excuse me. Wow. Should have muted that mic. My bad. Um, no, I am thankful for you for praying for us because it would have not been able to be done. It was a lot of long, hard work. Uh, but we are thankful that the gospel was preached and the kingdom was expanded. But this morning, uh, if you are a guest with us, we would ask that you would uh, grab the connection card in the pew in front of you, or the chair in front of you, whatever it's called. Um, and if you wouldn't mind filling that out and letting us know who you are. Additionally, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please be writing that and just pass it in the offering plate as it goes by. And we'll be happy to pray for you. Let's pray this morning and then we'll join back together in worship. There we go. Praise the Lord. Father, we come before you, and Lord, we are thankful, we are grateful that we get to be here in your presence. We are, we are just so grateful that we can come and be in a family of believers, that we can worship together, we can praise your name. God, I thank you for the work that um, our group of students got to do at Seeker Springs this week. I thank you for the ministry there. Um, that they focus on your gospel being proclaimed, the kingdom being expanded. I thank you for each of our students. Thank you for the light that they are. Thank you for the joy that they bring to my life. And, and then I get to call them my kids. God, I, I thank you for each and every member of this church that they have willingly and sacrificially poured into our students. They, they pour into our kids' ministry. That I can trust that as we go places, we are just covered with prayer. God, I thank you that, that we can be a church that does that. Father, in these moments, I just ask that you would allow us to set aside preference, set aside anything that's distracting us, and just worship you. That we would intentionally exalt your name, that we would exalt who you are as our God and Father. That we would focus ourselves only on who you are and the work that you have done and the work that you continue to do for us. That we would remember your word as we worship your name. We would remember that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That all things are yours. And that you reconciled us to yourself through your blood on the cross. Let us remember that as we worship. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and continue in worship? Standing here in your presence, thinking of the good things you have done, waiting here patiently just to hear your still small voice again, holy, righteous, faithful till the end, Savior. Just to hear. 
to come forward and Brother Kobe's the deacon of the week to come and give to us a prayer of commitment over this offering and ask God's blessing on it as we prepare to receive it. I want to remind you if you're visiting with us, be sure to turn in your visitor slip with us. We'd love to have a record of your visit today. I want to challenge you to give back to God the tithe that he asks of you. Give back in proportion to the way that he's blessed you this week and let's see if we can possibly outgive God. Can't do that, can you church? God's good to us all the time. Brother Kobe, you come and lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we so graciously thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your son. Dear Lord, just be with us as we go through this sermon. Help us to just be focused on you, our relationship with you, how much we should be loving you. Lord, bless this offering. Help multiply it so that it can be used for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. 
you, Brother Aaron, and thank you all for leading us in worship. I'd like to introduce our guest preacher this morning. I want you to give him a warm welcome as he comes. His name is Jeff Steed, and he is the director of planned giving for the SBTC Foundation. I'm sure he'll share a little bit more with the rest of you about that. Many of you have already met him as we had a special seminar for all adults during Sunday school. But Brother Jeff, would you go ahead and come and just bring to us the message that God has laid on your heart today? Would you all welcome him as he comes? Such an honor to be with you earlier in the, the day at the Sunday School time, and then also just to worship with you. I've been looking forward to this day for quite some time, and let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, we are so grateful for how much you love us. Lord, I thank you for the time of worship that we have spent with you already this morning. Lord, I, I pray that as we open your holy word today, Father, that you will speak to every single one of us in the room in some way today. Father, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word this morning. Please speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2018, we lost the following individuals. Uh, Billy Graham, American evangelist, prominent evangelical Christian figure, was ordained as a Southern Baptist minister in, in the 1940s and, and became internationally known in the 40s when he started doing the Crusades and, and, and had an incredible impact. One of his biographers placed him as one of the most influential Christian leaders of the 20th century. And I think we'd all agree with that, right? There are probably individuals in the room today that you have been impacted by the by the, by the ministry of Billy Graham or a family member has. We lost Billy last year. We also lost uh, individuals by the name of Bob Buford. Bob was an East Texas guy. And Bob was very successful in the first half of life with the cable TV and everything else and, and got to a point of halftime in his life and, and, and basically said, okay, I, you know, God's blessed me the first half, but what am I going to do for the kingdom? the second half of life, and, and wrote this book called Halftime. Some of you may have read it in the room. An incredible book. If, if you have not, I encourage you to do it. God worked through those words of that book in an incredible way. But Bob also passed away last year. We also lost Barbara Bush, the wife of George H.W. Bush, who was the 41st president of the United States. Yeah. I made a boo-boo. Okay. I forgot to dismiss all the kids to Children's oh, Church. Oh, oh. <laughs> I take full responsibility for interrupting his message today, but if you're going to Children's Church today, I'd like to dismiss you over there. I think Miss Amanda's waiting, and right. Pastor says, sorry. <laughs> All right. All right, no problem. No problem. Lots of happy faces, right? All right. So we also lost Barbara Bush last year. Barbara... Uh, the wife of George H.W. Bush, the 41st president of the United States of America. And she served as the first lady from 1989 to 1993. But Barbara had an incredible impact on the presidency of the United States of America when she was first lady. We also lost her husband, George H.W. Bush, passed away himself November 30th, 2018. And George was an aviator, a, aviator in World War II, a member of Congress, United Nations Ambassador, Director of the CIA, Vice President, and ultimately the President of the United States of America. Every single one of these individuals have passed away. But what they did on this earth will far outlive their earthly life. Their legacies will continue. Their impact will continue long after they have passed away. I want to talk to you about a woman in Scripture this morning that she also left an incredible legacy for you and I 2,000 years after the fact. And I want to look at her story this morning, and, and most of you are going to be familiar with her story. In fact, some of you have taught her story in Sunday school before. But I want to, if you'll turn to Luke 21 with me. Luke 21 this morning. Luke 21, and I'll begin in verse 1. Luke 21, beginning in verse 1. Luke 21, and he, the he here is Christ. And Christ looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he also saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, Truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in, put in more than all, 
For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. I believe this woman that we're looking at this morning in Luke 21, 1 to 4, left an incredible legacy for you and I today, 2,000 years after the fact. You might say, Jeff, why do you think that? It's because of what she was willing to do that day. She was willing to literally give out of her poverty to the Lord, to the kingdom. This, this woman, again, gave out of her poverty. What is poverty, by the way? Poverty is where you lack something, right? Or you perceive that you lack something in your life. More than likely, every single one of us in the room is in poverty in one way or the other. Poverty, again, is where you're lacking something. There may be some in the room, you can relate to this widow woman, to where you were impoverished from a financial standpoint, and ends just don't meet. There are others in the room today in which you may be impoverished from a time standpoint, in which literally you just don't have enough time in the day, right, to get things done. Maybe you're juggling all these balls between maybe uh, uh, family and work and church. and just, All these balls you're juggling, and you're just afraid you're going to drop one, right? We've probably all been there, right? But again, you may feel impoverished from a time standpoint because you can't get it all done. There are some in the room that would probably lobby for 25 hours in a day. Now, think about that for a moment. Extra hour? Okay, what would you do? I'm making a mental list right now of some things I would want to do, right? But if God decided to give us 25 hours in a day, what would we want the next week, right? You know how that goes, right? 26, right? It, it's, God knew what he was doing, obviously. 24 hours in a day, that's the way it's supposed to work, right? But again, maybe because of all that, that you're involved in in your life, you just don't have enough time. You may, you may feel impoverished in that area of your life. There are others in the room. You may be impoverished from a giftedness standpoint, right? And you may be thinking about the person beside you today and how gifted they are in a particular area. And you may feel impoverished because of that. You know, these incredibly uh, gifted worship team this morning. And by the way, I'm, I have the honor to be in different churches just about every week. Y'all are incredibly blessed to have this worship team, okay? Y'all are incredibly blessed. And, but I get a little envious of musically gifted people because I don't have that gift, right? In fact, that's an area of poverty for me, right? I, I can't do it, and I wish I could. But, it, but again, I'm, God just hasn't wired me that way. But again, whatever area of poverty it is for you, you if you're lacking in finances or time or, or giftedness or whatever it is, whatever area of your life in which you feel impoverished, you feel lacking, the ironic thing is, that may be the very area that God may call you to give out of. Have you noticed he does that once in a while, right? And you might say, Jeff, why, why wouldn't God call me to give out of an area of my life where I feel abundant, where I have to give it, right? But when God calls us as a believer in, in Jesus Christ, when God calls us to do something in our life, when God calls us, even if it's out of an area of poverty, that is, that is saying, God, I trust you, right? I'm going to depend upon your abundancy, not my own. So when God calls us to give out of an area of poverty, we've got to lean on him that much more in our life, right? We've got to depend upon his sufficiency, not our own, right? So you and I, when God calls us in our life, I want to encourage you to say yes to him, even if it's giving out of an area of poverty in your life. And by the way, this whole idea of God calling the people to give out of the area of poverty is nothing new in Scripture. We have this widow woman that we're talking about here this morning, but let's go back a few thousand years before that to the days of Moses. And remember the story when, when God told Moses to go to the Pharaoh guy. Remember that story? And he told him to go to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was in charge of Egypt. He was in charge of hundreds of thousands of Israelites. The Israelites were literally slaves, okay, to the Pharaoh. And, and, and what happened in that, that story? God told Moses to go to the Pharaoh guy and to what? Tell him, let my people go, right? Remember the story? And what was Moses' response? God, I can't do that. I'm paraphrasing, but God, I can't do that, right? I can't speak. I can't do this or that. Moses felt impoverished to do what God called him to do. But eventually, Moses was willing to do what God called him to do. And God made a way. God made a way because of his willingness to do whatever God called him to do in his life. This whole idea for God calling people to give out their area of poverty is nothing new 
in the history of time. I want to encourage us today when God calls, and by the way, God calls, right? Those that are believers in the room, those that have confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those that have embraced Him as their Lord and Savior, God calls us. God calls us to do things. Sometimes it may be minor in our mind. Sometimes it may be major, whatever it is. But God calls us. And why does He do that? He's growing us. He's growing us in our relationship with Him, right? That's the way God often works in, in our relationship as far as growing us in our relationship with Him through calling us to do things in our life. So God calls us, right? And God may call you in the next few minutes to do something. God may call you this, this afternoon. He may wake you up from your Sunday afternoon nap today, right? We need to do something. You may be driving to, to work tomorrow or school and, and God just speaks to a song on the radio and you know without a shadow of a doubt God is calling you to do something or maybe the next few weeks or months but when God calls. I want to encourage every single one of us to say yes to Him, whatever it is, to say yes to Him because that is God knocking at the door of your heart inviting you to walk through it and potentially experience Him like never before in your life. And when you experience God at that new way in your life, you never want to return the way things were. You want to walk further and further through that door and experience Him potentially like never before. So I want to encourage you today when God calls to say yes to Him, even if it's giving out of an area of poverty in your life, because that is God inviting you potentially to get to know him like never before. And that may be the only invitation we ever get. We don't know when we're leaving this place, right? And that may be the only invitation we ever get to have to get to know our Lord like never before in our life. This widow woman, I believe she had to groan in a relationship with God that day. How could she not have, right? Because of what she was willing to do. What'd she give that day? What'd this widow woman give? Two mites, right? Two mites. So if you were to take a penny out of, your, out of your pocket, one penny, slice that penny five ways. One penny, slice it five ways. Took two of those slices out. That is approximately the worth of what she gave that day. And it was worthless from a worldly standpoint, right? It wasn't worth anything. But to her, it meant something in her life because that's all she had. That's all she had, the scripture tells us. You know what, I read stories like this widow woman and, and others in Scripture and outside of Scriptures that have taken extreme steps for God. The question that often comes to my mind is what kind of person would do that? What kind of person would do that? Because I don't know if I'm there yet. But I believe when I ask that question, what kind of person would do that, God answers me the same way every time. So Jeff is the type of person that crosses it over the line. Said, so God, every cent in my bank account, every second of my day, every ounce of my existence as a human being, God, now is at your disposal. God, you're my master. I'm your servant, God. That's who I believe we're talking about here this morning in the form of this widow woman that was willing to do anything for God's kingdom. Some may be asking in the room, how can somebody do that? How can somebody take that extreme step across that line? And I believe the secret ingredient to what you and I are talking about here today, that secret ingredient to being willing to do anything that God calls us to do, that secret ingredient is faith. Faith that knowing that God is on the other side of that line, knowing that God is going to be there with you, knowing that God is going to provide whatever is needed to accomplish His will and way in your life. It's faith. What is faith to you? Think about that for a moment. What is faith? If you were to put that in one sentence, what is faith? There's probably as many people as they're here today, there's probably that many definitions of faith. I want us to focus in on what is that faith that can cause us to do whatever, thing, whatever God calls us to do. What is faith? Faith is depending upon the lift of air of an aircraft as you lift out, out that window and say that little prayer, no matter how many times you've flown, you just say, God, I hope this works the way it's always supposed to work, right? Having faith that it's going to work. Faith as well as that small child, depending upon the caring arms of their parent, knowing they're going to keep them secure and safe and not drop them, but safe and secure. Faith as well as depending upon the visibility of gravity as we're sitting and standing today. Faith as well as that baseball glove 
is that baseball is coming at you at 100 miles an hour, right? Have, having faith that it's going to be able to withstand the impact of that ball. Faith was demonstrated several years ago in a small farming community. And in that small farming community, they were heavily, heavily, heavily dependent on agriculture and farming. And it had not rained in weeks, and those weeks turned into months. And there was a great desperation in this town. In fact, the word around town is, are we going to survive? I mean, that's how desperate it was and, and the mindset around town. And on a particular Sunday, all the pastors of that town, of all the different uh, churches in that area, asked their people to do one thing, to show up the next Saturday at 12 o'clock at the town square to simply pray to simply ask that God would intervene. And they also ask him to do something as well when they come that Saturday, to bring some type of object of faith, just something that, uh, that reminded them of their faith in God, you know, a, a scripture, a cross, or whatever it was, just reminding them of their faith in God. It didn't rain that week, and the desperation continued to grow. And what happened is about 12 o'clock on Saturday, masses start showing up in this town, like people are looking around like, I had no idea this many people existed in the area, all right? But I mean, that shows you the desperation as this masses of people just started showing up to do one thing, to pray at 12 o'clock. And 12 o'clock, they began to do that and pray and pray. And what I'm about to say was not in the weather forecast for the day. But about 1 o'clock, some clouds began to roll in to that area. It began to sprinkle in that area. It began to downpour in that area. And that prayer service turned into a worship service pretty quick as they began just praising God, their faith objects, their scriptures, whatever they brought. They started holding those to the heavens and just praising God at the top of their lungs for literally showing up in their existence, a time that probably every one of them would never forget in their entire life. But there was a nine-year-old boy in the middle of that crowd with a faith object. And that morning, as he was getting ready to go to that town square to pray, he was thinking, okay, what do I take? Faith object, what do I take that reminds me of my faith in God? Well, after one o'clock, as, as he was in the midst of all those adults that were worshiping God because of the rains were pouring, that, that nine-year-old boy was holding his faith object. And that faith object was an umbrella, an umbrella knowing that God would show up. And when God calls us in our life to do something, and, and it's a matter of crossing over that line with the umbrella, knowing that God is going to show up, knowing that God is going to send the rains, and when we do that, when we experience God like that in our life, we can't help but grow in our relationship with God. We can't help it. And when we experience that, we're saying, God, challenge me again. Call me again, God, because I want to know you today more than I knew you yesterday. God, I want to know your presence. I want to know who you are. And again, it is God inviting us to walk through that door when he calls us to do something, to experience him potentially like never before in our life. So when God calls, I want to encourage every single one of us in the room to say yes to him. There's something really important also about what we're talking about here today and this type of giving of ourself and being willing to do anything for the kingdom of God, anything for the cause of Christ, this type of giving of ourself often occurs in here at the heart and not always up here. And you might say, Jeff, what do you mean by that? Because in following God in our life, it's not always going to make sense up here. From a human mind standpoint, it's just, did it make sense for this widow woman to give everything she had that day? It didn't make sense at all, Right? Apparently, she felt, she felt called of God to do that. Why else would she have done it, right? And so it's a matter of sometimes following God with our heart when he calls us because it's not always going to make sense up here from a, from a human mind world standpoint. If we were to go around this room today and have testimonies of God calling you to do something, there's going to be many in here more than likely that it did not make sense at the time. I can give you a few of those stories, okay, as personally, that it did not make sense. But again, God's ways are beyond our ways. Thank goodness, right? And, and the way God's economy works, it, it, it's, it's, it's different than the way we think, right? Sometimes we just say, God, I trust you in here, even when it doesn't make sense at the time. And it may not make sense this side of heaven. It may not make sense this side of heaven when he calls us to do something. 
About half of us in the room are analytical thinkers. You know what I mean by that? We like numbers. We like for things to add up, right? I'm one of those, good or bad, you know? But it's very difficult for us that are analytical thinkers to embrace what we're talking about here today. Because we like for things to add up. We like for things to make sense before we do them, right? I'm one of those. I hope I'm not the only one that's done this. But if I have a major decision to make, I'll usually get in front of the computer or get a piece of paper out. And I will list all the advantages from making a decision this way over here, right? And all the disadvantages over here. If the advantages outweigh the disadvantages, I've got my answer. Easy, right? I hope I'm not the only one that's done that in the room. But, but you know, realistically, for those that think something some way along those lines, it is very difficult for us to embrace what we're talking about in the scripture this morning about being willing to do anything that God calls us to do, even out of an area of poverty, because we like for things to add up. But I'm just telling you this morning, it's not always going to make sense. It's not always going to make sense. Sometimes we have to follow him in here. And God, I trust you in my heart. And I'm making sense up here, God, but I'm going to trust you in my heart that I'm going to follow you wherever you send me, where, whatever you want me to do, God. There's another reason why it's important to follow God in our heart when it doesn't make sense up here is because when God calls us to do something, who else shows up? At least with me, every time God calls me to do something, Satan is right there whispering in my ear, telling me every reason imaginable, every excuse imaginable not to follow the will of God. That's his job, right? Satan's job. I mean, but just know more than likely that's going to happen. And he gives us every reason up here from a rationale standpoint to not follow the will of God. But I want to encourage you this morning when God calls, be faithful to that. Be willing to do whatever God calls you to do in your life and defeat that temptation of Satan. Sometimes when I read stories like this about this widow woman and others in Scripture, and sometimes stories, real stories outside of Scripture, I like to put myself there. You may be the exact same way to see how a story kind of unravels, right? in your mind's eye. I want us to do that with the story this morning. Okay? And what I'm about to tell you, this, is, this, isn't, this part's not in Scripture. This is just the way I look at the story as I read through it. Okay? But I, but I want us to think about going back 2,000 years ago, being in the same building of this widow woman. And I, I, just just the way I look at it, okay? I, I kind of picture him in a, in a place of worship. Uh, let's say similar to this, with some windows, no glass, obviously, that day and time, but, but some windows to where they can sh pull back the shutters to let some fresh air in, right? Maybe some natural light in. And more than likely, a, a place of worship was beside the busy city streets, right? That day and time. And similar today. And, and so you've got all the conversations occurring outside the place of worship, and all those conversations coming in, all the noises and You've got the animals passing by, right? All the oxen and whatever else back then, the mules and all that, and all the animal smells kind of coming in, you know? You've got all that going on. Just for a few moments, I want us to consider ourselves there. Just think about it in your mind's eye, being with that widow woman 2,000 years ago when this story took place. More than likely, they were sitting in some type of rugs or primitive chairs at that point in time. Probably some old lamps. They would often take clay pots, put some animal fat in there, put a wick, light it, and have that as light. Kind of, so maybe some of those spread around for light. But just for a few moments, I want us to consider ourselves there as far as just seeing that play out. And by the way, Christ was there. He's the one telling the story here. And I, I see him off to the side just kind of watching all this play out, right? Just the way I look at it, but when it came time for the offering, I, I, I kind of picture people lining up. You know, let's say there's a, a glass, uh, not glass, but a, a clay pot down here for the offerings, tithes and offerings. And I, I kind of picture, let's, say, let's take this aisle right here, okay? And just, just for a moment, imagine folks starting to line up for the offering time that day, 2,000 years ago, which was pretty common, the line format. And so I want you just for a second to imagine in the middle of that line that widow woman standing there 2,000 years ago as we are with her that day. In a way, can't you see uh, Satan whispering in her ears? Saying, Woman, I know what you're thinking about doing. God didn't need that money, right? In fact, what are you, if you give it, what are you going to eat tonight? 
How are you going to survive this week? The reason I think that is because that's what Satan does to me. When God calls me to do something, gives me every excuse imaginable not to follow the will of God. But I want you in your mind's eye, just see that line starting to come forward. They're putting their offerings, ties in to this, this clay pot down here. And the widow woman is getting closer and closer, and probably the heart is racing a little bit faster because she knew the significance of what she was about to do. Uh, not that it was worth a lot of money, but it was worth a lot to her because that's all she had. She knew the significance of that. And she comes on down here, and it's her turn at that clay pot. And she puts in one of those mites, one of those coins. And she could have said, God, I'm good. I gave you half of what you want me to give. God, I'm good with that. And gone back to her chair and just been done with it. That's not what she did. According to the scripture, she gave it all. She gave it all. In your mind's eye, I want you to see that second coin hitting the side of that clay pot. I want you to hear it hitting that clay pot. That woman was faithful. That woman was faithful with what God had called her to do that day. Defeated any temptation of Satan. I want to encourage you, when God called you, just know Satan's going to be there giving you every excuse imaginable. I encourage you to defeat that temptation. And those that are believers in the room, you have the Spirit of God living within you. You have access to the power to defeat that temptation. We can't do it on our own, but God, through us, can defeat that temptation. I want to encourage you to do that and be willing to do whatever God calls you to do. So when God calls, I want to encourage you in the next few minutes, hours, days, weeks, whenever it is, when God calls you, to be willing to say yes to God, even if it's giving out of an area of poverty in our life, because that is God knocking at the door of your heart, inviting you to walk through it and potentially experience Him like never before. This type of giving of herself, again, often occurs at the heart, because it's not always going to make sense up here. It's just not from a human mind world standpoint. And I want to encourage you today to defeat any temptation of Satan, because it will be there. It will be there. Individuals like this widow woman at, that at some point in their life cross over and say, God, everything I have is now at your disposal. Every cent in my bank accounts, every second of my day, every ounce of my DNA, God, now is at your feet. You're at your disposal, God, to use however you want to advance your kingdom. Those individuals that cross over that line in such an incredible, extreme way in their life, God tends to use in pretty incredible ways. Do you think this widow woman... 2,000 years ago, had any idea that her story would end up in this holy book. You think she had any idea that millions and millions and millions of people around this world over the last 2,000 years would read her story and be inspired by it? You think she had any idea that on June 23rd, 2019, at Nolan River Road Baptist Church, we would be looking at our life. There is no way. There is no way she knew the significance of what God would do through her life. And that was probably 30 minutes of her life, right? Give or take a few minutes. Depends on how long the message was that day, right? But, I mean, literally 30 minutes of her life, right? And that is a legacy that she has left for you and I 2,000 years after the fact. Legacies are left in lots of different ways. Impact for those for generations to come are left in lots of different ways. It may be 30 minutes of your life like this widow woman that God worked through it in such incredible ways that God may use that for the sake of impacting people around you now but for generations to come like this widow woman. That may be your legacy. Legacies are left often in the way that we teach values, not just values, Christian values, to our children, to our grandchildren, to our great-grandchildren, of what it means to be a, a, a submitted child follower of Jesus Christ. God may want to use you to, to leave legacies to your family by the way you teach those values. There may be some in the room today, you may be the only believer in your family God may want to use you to help bring your family to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and that be your legacy to your family. Legacies are left in lots of different ways over the last 15 plus years. 
I've had the honor in ministry to help many, many, many individuals who, have last, who in their last will and testimony have left legacies to what they have valued in life, their family and the kingdom. Legacies are left in lots of different ways. But the question I have for you this morning and for me is what will our legacy be or legacies? What will be the impact long after we have left this place and enjoying heaven? What will be our impact? What will be our legacies that we will leave behind? Are you ready? Are you prepared to do whatever God calls you to do for the sake of impact, for the sake of legacy? Are you ready? In other words, have you crossed over? Have you crossed over the line and be willing to do anything that our Lord calls you to do? Are you ready? Are you willing? Are you prepared? David Livingston is one of my favorite historical figures outside of Scripture. And some of you probably know the, the story of David. And I know there's some missionaries in the room today, and, and I mean, you probably know the story, but David lived a long time ago, and it, back in the 1800s, and he was sitting in a worship service like this. And that morning, they had a medical missionary at their church, which is very rare in that day and time. Medical missionary speaking, and, and God tapped David on the shoulder, figuratively, of course, and said, David, I want you to do that. I want you to go to medical missions, and David's response was, God, I can't do that. I'm not equipped. I, I can't do that, God. But before long, the conviction upon David's life was so overwhelming, he knew he, there was only one response he could give to God, and that was say yes to whatever he wanted to accomplish in his life. And David submitted that, to that call. He would end up being married in 1844 with six children, but his wife and child at the time in the 1845, the Livingstons, went to Africa to be medical missionaries. And they started ministering in the outskirts of Africa. And, and God was doing a great work in their life and just sharing the gospel message on the outskirts. It was much too dangerous on the inner part. Cannibalism, violence was very much real 200 years ago in the center part of Africa. So they were on the outskirts ministering because it was much too dangerous on the inner part. And then David gets that tap on the shoulder from God again. So David, I, I want you to go to the heart of Africa. I want you to go to the center of Africa where my name is not known. That's where I want you to take my gospel. David struggled with that many, many weeks and months because he knew it was much too dangerous for his family and it, it, he didn't want to be away from them, which is completely understandable. And, but before long, and, and by the way, every letter he would write back home to people back in London, he would end it like this. Who will penetrate the heart of Africa. You can see God working on him, right? Before long, he, he knew he had to submit to that call. And so very grievingly, on April 23rd, 1852, through many tears, he, he put his family on a ship and sent them back home to London, to England. And he threw himself literally into the heart of Africa to, to do the work that God had called him to do. Had 31 attacks of inmate fever. Had the most painful type of dysentery. Had, was deprived of food many, many, many days. Saw literally how cannibalism and violence was rampant in that day and time 200 years ago. It was a culture shock, as if it would be you and I going back 200 years ago in the center of Africa. It was a culture shock, but he continued to be faithful, and God worked through him in incredible ways. And then he missed his family dearly, as you can imagine, and went home to see them a few times. We call it furlough today for missionaries. And one of those in 1862, one of those furloughs when he was home with his family in London, and his, his wife passed away. She died. And we know from his journal that David was finished with life. He was spent. He didn't feel like he had anything else to give to God or to anybody else. He was just finished. He was so depressed over that, he wanted to go in a closet literally and just die. That was his state of mind. It took seven years of God continuing to work on his heart seven years before he returned to the heart of Africa. And when he did that, thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals in the heart of Africa heard the gospel message of our Lord because of his willingness to go. And God did an incredible uh, thing through his work there. March 19, 1872, he wrote in his journal, 59 years old, my birthday, my Jesus, 
my king, my lord, my all again, dedicate my whole self to thee. May 1, 1873, he was in a tent. There was a boy outside the tent hollered in for David, and David didn't respond. And the boy went to a nearby community and got somebody, and they went in the tent together, and they found David there, and there was still a candle flickering off to the side, and he had been praying. He'd been kneeling beside his cot in prayer before his Lord. His head was in his hand. And he had died that way in prayer before his Lord that day. The physical heart in that part of Africa represented something of passion. They physically took his heart, buried it under a tree in the center of Africa where they knew his passion was sent his body back to Westminster Abbey, London, where it's still buried today. But somehow, his story, David's story got out. The New York Times had not been around that long. As several other world newspapers picked up on his story and published it. And what do you think God did through that? Inspired many, many, many individuals to go to the heart of Africa to pick up on the work that God had started through David's life. When I read stories about David Livingston and this widow and many others that have taken extreme steps for our Lord, for the kingdom of God, for the cause of Christ, when I read stories like that, the question that comes to my mind, what kind of person would do that? And God answered me the same way every time, Jeff. The type of person that, that has crossed over. And they are no longer on this earth for themselves, but for my glory. I want to ask you if you'll stand with me this, this morning. I want to ask you if you'll bow your heads with me this morning and close your eyes. And I want to ask the worship team to come this morning. And I want to ask ask us a question this morning that I want to encourage every single one of us in the room to answer just between us and God. But the question is this, where do you stand in relation to the line? There are some in the room today that would say, Jeff, I've never crossed over that line. I want to encourage you to do something very brave this morning. I want to encourage you to step over that line. Pastor Adam and, and others will be down here at the front during our time of invitation this morning. And I want to encourage you to do something pretty bold this morning. I want to encourage you to step out from where you're at, take that step and say, Adam, or whoever you talk to here at the front, saying, tell me how to cross over that line. I will tell you it's the most important decision you will make in your entire life. There are others in the room today that would say, Jeff, my story is this. I've crossed over that line many years ago but my feet keep touching the line. My level of commitment to God keeps touching the line. If that's your story today, I want to encourage you to recommit your life to Christ. I want to encourage you to put both feet firmly planted on the other side of that line and allow God to use your life in such incredible ways. There are others in the room who say, Jeff, my story is this. I've been a Christian for many years. I feel like my relationship with God is growing. Both feet are firmly planted. I feel like I'm in a good place with God. If that's your story this morning, I want to encourage you to ask God one question this morning. God, what's next? What's next that you want to do with my life that will have impact today but for generations to come? God, what is next? During this time of invitation, I want to encourage you to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. This, this stage is a prayer altar this morning. There are individuals down at the front that would love to just visit with you. Whatever God's working on your heart this morning, I want to encourage you to respond during this time of invitation today. Are you washed in the blood in the Thank you for joining us here at Nolan River.
River Road Spot. Baptist Church. If this message impacted you or touched you in any way, please feel free and let us know. We'd love to hear about it. Our phone number is 817-645-5642, or you can go to nrrbc.org. Thank you.